Um, next, I'd like to welcome Adrian Moat to the stage uh, to continue on the green software discussion. Uh, Adrian is at, um, excuse me, is at ChainGuard and is an advocate for all things technical, etc. Uh, but I'll let him speak for himself. Welcome to the stage, Adrian. Thank you. Is that the first one? Oh, I've lost my notes. That's not going to go well. We were here earlier. Hmm. Oh well. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about bloated software, um, why it's bad for the planet, and how Wolfie Linux can help. Um, does anybody know who this is? Just shout out. Yes, thank you. So we got it wrong last night. I was like, hmm. Um, yeah, it's Admiral Grace Hopper. Um, she was like a fundamental pioneer in computing. She was involved with UNIVAC. Um, and one of the most famous stories she was, well, that she's famous for is this, where the term debugging comes from. So one day, um, basically, a moth landed on the frame, mainframe and blew a relay, and the mainframe went down. Um, so they made a report and taped the actual moth to it. And that's where we get the term debugging from. But that's not the story that I want to talk about today. So she's also quite famous for another story. Um, and it's about nanoseconds. So you're probably aware or can guess that a nanosecond is a billionth of a second. But as sort of human beings, we can't really think in billions and billionths. Oh, I find my notes are just really, really small. Oh, that's weird. OK, fixed. Um, so what Grace Hopper said was, well, OK, in, the, in terms of computing, um, a nanosecond is 11.8 inches. And the reason it's 11.8 inches is because that's how far a computer message can theoretically travel. OK, it's actually how far light will travel in a vacuum. But we can get to a you know, a surprisingly close percentage of that, even in sort of regular cat cables. And what Admiral Hopper would do was she would turn up to presentations and hand out nanoseconds to people. Watch out. Let's try to do it again. Hey, so that is a nanosecond, or 11.8 inches of wire. Thankfully, I've not hurt anybody. Um, now, she did this for a couple of reasons. One was she had to explain to generals and military officials um, why it took so long for the computers to talk to a satellite. And she was like, well, there's a lot of nanoseconds between here and the satellite. But the other reason that she did it was to um, make the point much more eloquently than I am that every time we waste an instruction in software, we're effectively throwing away nanoseconds. And so she just wanted to make it tangible, like what we're losing every time we waste instructions when writing software. And I don't think she'd be too impressed by like, how bloated software has become over the last couple of decades. Um, I found it difficult to get an authoritative figure. Um, I think you might have had uh, better figures in your presentation, but um, IT accounts for somewhere around 10% of global electricity consumption. And it's growing. Um, so you know that's mainly coming from data centers, networks, etc. You put it all together, and it accounts for a sizable fraction of today's global electricity. But the sad thing is, a good chunk of that is wasted because it's being caused by bloated software, which is increasing the amount of computer we require, increasing the amount of network usage, and increasing the amount of disk space we require for software. And beyond that, bloated software tends to be slower to use, um, and it's harder to re reason about and analyze. Um, the easiest way to sort of visualize this growth is to look at the average web page size. And we can see that's more than quadrupled over the last decade. But as web pages have got larger, um, our networks and our hardware have also got faster. So most people haven't really noticed this. Um, at least if you have access to broadband internet. 
Now, a good percentage of this increase is for good reasons. It's things like high-res images and other multimedia like video. But some of it's just kind of wasted as well, especially when we're pulling in JavaScript libraries and APIs that we don't really need. And some of them themselves can be more bloated than they need to be. Um, and that's why we end up with web pages that are just much larger than they ever needed to be. Um, but that's actually not what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about the front end or web pages, but I want to talk about the, the back end. So the IT industry has wholeheartedly embraced cloud computing. Nearly everything runs there in the cloud nowadays, and you're using providers like AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure. Um, and all clouds are actually based on virtual machines. The most important aspect of VM is basically it's a portable way of hosting an application. So I can take a VM running on one server, and it'll run identically on a different server. Um, VMs are also self-contained. So I can put everything I need from my system or application into a single virtual machine. But because of that, they also tend to be quite large. And there is some overhead due to things like emulation. So kind of as a reaction to that, the industry came up with this concept of containers. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, um, you can think of a container as a sort of lightweight VM. It's not exactly what it is, but never mind. Um, but basically, containers have most of the advantages of VMs, but considerably less overhead. Um, but the big difference is that containers are designed to host a single application or process, whereas a virtual machine will typically have multiple applications and processes inside it. And the offshoot of this is that we've gone from having like 100 gigabyte VMs to 100 megabyte containers. So that's an order of magnitude smaller. Um, now, that's not an entirely fair comparison, uh, because you'll need multiple containers to uh, mimic your, your VM with multiple applications running inside it. But it still gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, and that brings us to the, the main part of this talk, which is on operating systems. And I'm talking about Linux operating systems here, which are the, the standard in the cloud. So things like uh, our distributions like Red Hat, uh, Alpine there, Debian, uh, and Ubuntu. Now, all these projects started by targeting servers. So they're designed to run on hardware, especially racks in a server room somewhere. And then we moved to VMs. And that was largely fine. But now we've moved to containers. And it's still OK. But now we're basically running these operating systems that are designed for running servers with multiple users, and multiple applications, et cetera. But we're using them to run a tiny little container with one process. And so that's basically the reason why Google started the DistroList project. What Google did was they took the Debian operating system, and they said, well, how much can we pull out of Debian and still have something left that can run our application in a container? And what they found was they could pull out most of it. Um, you do still need a few things, such as TLS certificates to talk to of websites um, and other systems securely. Um, you need time zone data, typically. And there's also some common like Linux directories and files you'll need, like slash Etsy or slash temp. But that's about it. And you can go from a 140 megabyte Debian image to a 3 megabyte container and still have enough to run your application. So that was a really pretty fantastic result. But the problem is DistroList was really a bit of an experiment. And it's not the easiest to extend. So if you want to add another operating system package into a distroless container, um, you can do it. But it involves using stuff like Bazel. And it's, yeah, it's not easy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we at ChainGuard created the Wolfie Linux distribution. Um, and the Wolfie Linux distribution was designed from the start to allow you to create small containers that run in the cloud. In a lot of ways, it's a spiritual successor to DistroList, as several of the people that worked on a DistroList project at Google um, are actually founders of ChainGuard and the Wolfie project. And also, it's very similar goals for DistroList and Wolfie. 
But Wolf is not designed to be a full-blown operating system running dozens of synchronous applications and multiple users. Um, and so to be more technical for a moment, um, what this means is in Wolfie, we've com our packages are compiled and performance tuned for common C cloud CPUs such as Graviton. Um, we make sure our packages are broken down into small pieces so your containers can only, only pull in the software they actually need. Uh, we don't supply a kernel because if you're using containers, you'll generally use the, ho the host operating system kernel. And basically, this is the result of applying these techniques. So if we look at the size of various container base images, you can see on the left there, we've got the Red Hat Fedora image. Um, and then you've got Debian in green there. Um, and then we've got the Ubuntu image, which just gets down to around 70 megabytes. Um, and then Alpine, it's a lot smaller. So Alpine is quite a minimal Linux distribution. And it gets down to 7.66 megabytes. Um, but way down at the bottom, we have both the Distrilis, um, the Google Distrilis image and the ChainGuard image, um, sorry, the Wolfie image, which are around three megabytes. So that's a lot of software and a lot of bloat that we've managed to get rid of. And most of what's been taken out is sort of OS tooling and libraries that are unneeded by the sort of majority of applications. So you know, utilities such as Tar, Cut, and Awk, as well as package managers and shells. And at ChainGuard, we've actually used Wolfie to build a bunch of application images. So for example, we've built our own version of the Redis image. And if you compare the sizes of common Redis images, so we can look at the official image on the Docker Hub, um, Redis Latest, which is based on Debian, and that's 157 megabytes in size. The Alpine image is 38 megabytes, but our image is smaller still at 13.7. So we've managed to cut a whole bunch of bloat there, through just using Wolfie. Um, very similar story of Nginx. We got down to around 17.8 megabytes there. And we also have images for runtimes uh, and programming languages. So here's the one for the GRE. If you look at the Eclipse Temerin image, that's around 419 megabytes. But our GRE image is around 274 megabytes. We did have to create some extra tooling to do this sort of thing. So we have a tool called Melange, which is, and all this tooling is open source as well. Um, Melange builds our Wolfie OS packages. It's both declarative and reproducible, uh, and it's pipeline oriented and designed to run in systems such as GitHub Actions. Um, we also have AppCo, or APKO, uh, and that's how we actually build our container images. So we don't use Docker build. Um, we have a much simpler system called APKO. It uh, can't do a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that Docker build can do, we can't do. Um, all APKO really does is assemble Wolfie packages into a container image. But it's also fully declarative and reproducible, um, a little bit simpler, and it allows us to assemble containers without a package manager or shell, which is really useful. OK, so I want to move to look at the future now. Um, containers have effectively reduced some of the size and complexity associated with VMs. But there's other techniques and paradigms that can take this even further. And so, a lot of you have probably heard of functions as a service or services like AWS Lambda. And here we're trying to say, you know, let's not worry about the OS at all, you know, just to run this bit of code. And this has the potential to reduce blow even further on the back end. But interestingly, what you'll probably find is most of these services are based on containers underneath the hood. Um, one thing that I'm very interested in, and uh, I'm very sad that this never become mainstream, is unikernels. So a unikernel is basically the idea of combining the Linux kernel and your application into a single binary. And so you can end up with something that can be booted directly in hardware or run on a VM hypervisor. And basically, the idea here is that Linux kernel itself has a lot of bloat. So most applications don't actually require a lot of stuff in the Linux kernel. Um, so for example, one of the things in the Linux kernel is multi-user support. You know, and that basically goes back to mainframes in the 1970s, when everybody was logged into the same machine. And that's not really what we do today. So it's something the majority of applications 
don't need. Um, we can also cut out a lot of drivers. You're not going to need a floppy disk driver in the cloud, for example. And actually, you might not even need a file system at all if your application can run entirely in memory. So with using um, unikernels, you can end up with something that's much smaller, uh, potentially a lot faster, and potentially more secure because you're cutting out a lot of um, potential attack surface. OK, so I'll wrap things up. Um, when you go away today, if you're a developer or you're responsible for IT systems, IT systems at all, please do keep in the back of your mind um, Hopper's cables and think about it when you're dropping nanoseconds on the floor and whether or not you can move to a more efficient paradigm. So can you replace VMs with containers? Or can you look at functions as a service? And there are some easy wins, um, including have um, the, the Wolfie Linux distro, which can definitely help some of you, I think. OK, thank you very much.